there is an exceptional variety and degree of educational research happening across the university. It's an exciting time. The faculty level, at the program department levels, at the school level, and at the university level through various initiatives, this being one of them, HarvardX being another, TLT being another. I'm going to talk to you about some of that work. Generally speaking, the research mission of those efforts is to conduct and communicate rigorous, multidisciplinary, and innovative research into learning and teaching that transforms how we think about and how we practice education at Harvard and beyond. Use inspired basic research, research that's informed by theory, research that's in, that informs theory, research that is informed by practice, research that informs practice. At Hilt, we have a wonderful collection of research. Most of it I'm not going to talk about. I don't have time. If you want to learn about it, go online. We have descriptions of all of these projects. We've got research fellows who want to talk with you. We have handouts at the registration that table that describe them. We bucket them into three buckets, foundational challenges, instructional methods and modalities, and student engagement, motivation, and behavior. We try to address things on the individual level, the interpersonal level, and the institutional level. The hardest part for me about doing this research, and maybe about doing research in general, is picking a question or a set of questions from the universe of possible questions that are very interesting. And in education research, I mean, gosh, those three levels across all Harvard schools, what do you prioritize? That is a challenging question. I grew up in Concord, always inspired by this guy, Henry David Thoreau, as I was told to pronounce his last name. This quote I've always found very meaningful. There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. Larry Lessig likes this quote, too. Education research is not about good and evil, but we can't just hack at the branches. It's important to hack at some of those branches. We have to be root strikers, too. In the deepest, darkest, hardest, most exciting, most challenging question of all for me is this. How do we measure learning and teaching? How many of you think course evaluations are a good measure of teaching? Raise your hands. Couple? How many of you think, talk to me afterwards. Uh, uh, no, actually, they correlate with learning, but it's not very high. Uh, how many of you think grades are a good measure of student learning? Couple of you? Talk to Chris afterwards. He's back there. <laughs> um, so if we do not have good, authentic, effective measures of teaching and learning. How can we incentivize it? How can we reward it? How can we value it? How can we do education research? So that is why, for me, it is a foundational problem. So where do we start now? Well, I was inspired by your responses at last conference to this fill in the blank. As Aaron pointed out this morning, the thing that jumps out is engagement. There is a consensus that a critical, essential part of good teaching and learning is engagement. So let's unpack that a little. Engagement comes in different forms. Affective, heart, cognitive, mind, behavioral, hands, as we'll talk about feet. We are doing lots of work on this. Selene, wave to people. That's Selene. She's doing work that shows how these different types of engagement depend upon instructional format. Is it a person talking on a stage? Are you just hearing someone's voice? Are you reading text? Are you watching an animation? Are you watching narrated PowerPoint slides? Albert, raise your hand. Albert, in collaboration with Todd, Lo Todd Rogers at the Kennedy School, launched today an experiment through HarvardX into commitment devices and how that those behavioral economic term, if you've got skin in the game, if you've got reputation on the line, if you've got money at stake, might promote engagement. Justin, raise your hand. Justin is doing lots of work on how to promote positive engagement in online learning, looking at measures of persistence, performance, and participation. Jake and Joseph, where are you guys? Raise your hand. Two new Harvard X fellows, second day in the job. You're going to do great work. <laughs> 
So I want to fo focus on behavioral engagement. And the inspiration for this project came from David Malin. 2011, one of my first uh, projects was to analyze some data that he shared with us. David did this really simple, interesting thing, which was to ask students at every problem set every week, did you come to lectures that week? And then we can plot that from first lecture to last lecture in terms of the percentage of students who self-reported coming to lecture. What you see is this plot. Starts up pretty high, and David's course is amazing. It's unusual, and we'll talk about whether these are representative or not. Declined to about 60%. The most interesting thing here is that what first glance might appear to be noise is not noise. It's day a week effects. More people can re report coming on Monday than Wednesday and Friday. Whenever a metric yields surprising findings, it's a signal to me as a researcher that's an interesting metric. Mike and Bill, raise your hands. Mike, Bill back there, they're doing some work. They've done some work in actual classrooms here that shows the more students report attending lecture, the more they report feeling engaged in the course, the more work they do in the course, the better they do in the course, and the higher they rate the course. The questions we have to face here, is this representative of Harvard courses more generally? David's uh, course is an unusual one. And then, also, is there a bias in self-reported attendance? So here's what we did. We looked at attendance objectively across 10 courses involving 2,000 students. And I'm going to share those results. And they're all going to look the same. We got start of the semester and end of the semester, first, last lecture. And we got percentage of final enrollees who attended. Now, sometimes that number might be greater than 100 because it's shopping period. These are data from the college because people drop courses. Now, let me say that all the faculty here uh, said we could share these data. Moreover, they asked us to share these data. Moreover, they said, you can identify me and my course. We're not doing that. <laughs> um, but I was really impressed and proud of them in Harvard. So some of them are here today. Can we just give them a quick round of applause? <laughs> Brave souls. So uh, these courses aren't ordered in any particular way. I'm just going to go through it. What do you guys think those big spikes are? Midterms. Yep, people show up for exams. What do you think these spikes are? Day of week. Yep. This course was offered on Tuesday and Thursday. And almost all the time, attendance drops during Thursday. On all these plots, you'll see spring, right before spring break around here, and you'll notice some pretty dramatic drops. This course, very high attendance across the board. There's an optional lecture, exam spikes, day a week effects. This course, also very high attendance, except for the Friday before spring break. <laughs> Lots of quizzes in here, a couple midterms. Friday before spring break is a terrible time for attendance. <laughs> <laughs> big spikes here, big day a week effects. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Thursday before spring break, not much better at time. Day a week effects, exam spikes, linear declines over time with pretty linear day a week effects layered on top of that. Optional movies, probably not the best way to get people to attend. <laughs> Guest speakers, maybe so. Look at this. Very consistent high attendance. OK, you, you're sensing some of the similarities here. So let me just say one thing from looking at the plots uh, within courses over time. Big day a week effects. Monday to Wednesday, Tuesday to Thursday, you lose about 5% of students. Wednesday to Friday, you lose 10% of students. This course was unusual one. It started out pretty low. Uh, lectures were uh, optional for this course. Big exam spike. Uh, some seniors 
took their exams later, so that's why it's below 100. So here's the interesting thing for me. What explains these differences between courses? And in order to get some traction on that question, you have to come up with a statistic for each course. You can take the average attendance. That's fine. It's OK. Better thing to do is, get first of all, get rid of the weird shopping period, get rid of the exams, get rid of optional lectures. And so when you do that for this course, it looks like this. And then fit a line to it. That gives you a slope, it gives you an intercept, it gives you a starting point, it gives you an ending point. And then, for all the courses, you can put them on one plot. And here's what that looks like for these 10 courses. What jumps out to me here is the incredible variability. So 60% represents two things. One of them I'm actually not as interested in. Some of you may be, may be a cheap headline that comes out of this. But 60% of students uh, on any given lecture on the average across these 10 courses, 60% of students are there on the average. Here's what I think is way more interesting. The range in average attendance between the lowest and the highest course is 60% too. You got about 35% for one course and up to about 95%. That is incredible. So take out your phones, take out your laptops. We're going to poll you. Our job is not just to describe, it's to, to explain. And with only 10 courses, we're limited. We're only going to find whopping big effects here. And more research is needed to actually figure out what explains these differences between courses. But to get you thinking, here are your options. And it doesn't matter whether you're measuring average attendance, loss in attendance, starting attendance, ending attendance. The answer is the same for now. Is it grading policy? Is it meeting time or day? Is it something in student ratings, the overall rating, the difficulty rating, the lecture effectiveness rating? Is it the availability of lecture videos on course sites? Or is it students' reasons for enrolling in the course? Think about it, take a minute, register your vote. And then Zach in a minute show. Actually, you can show now. We'll see him as they come in. Don't just vote based on what other people say, though. Okay, it's settling down. The winner is students' reasons for enrolling a course. I'll confess we don't have a great measure of that. Uh, but you're right. These people are also right. Grading policy and students' reasons. So far, anyway, the availability of lecture videos, student ratings, or meeting time and day do not explain these differences. Switch it over. <laughs> okay, so not those three, the other two, and about equally so. So here's the same plot I showed before, but with those two variables. So this is the percentage of students' grades that was based upon their attendance. Attendance was measured via clickers. The top three have 4, 10, and 5%. And they also, students report taking those courses to fulfill pre-med requirements. There are other responses. Are you taking this course for an elective? Didn't matter. Are you taking it to fulfill another requirement? Didn't matter. Just this pre-med one. And how to interpret that isn't, isn't clear. And it's not clear which one of these or which combination of them is explaining this variance. This line I love, and I do not understand, and this is why we need to do more research. This course, high attendance to begin with, high attendance to end with. Here's what I can tell you. Very accessible, appealing content. Amazing lecturer, gets the highest ratings of any of these courses. And interestingly, only makes lecture videos available week before exams. I don't know if any of that matters, but that's what's unusual about this course. One of the faculty members here who use clickers had this to say. 
using clickers and having clicker participation be part of the overall grade has, in my opinion, been directly responsible for the high attendance rates. Research will tell. So recap. We desperately need better measures of learning and teaching. If we care about engagement, as all of you said we do, most of you said we do, we should measure it in its various forms, one of which is behavioral engagement. Lecture attendance is one measure of behavioral engagement. People vote with their feet. Huge differences. Oh, I skipped one. Lecture attendance declines over time in terms of Monday to Wednesday to Friday, Tuesday to Thursday, and over the semester. And in some of David Malin's uh, self-reported data, actually it declines from freshman year to senior year. Huge, huge differences exist between lecture courses and attendance. Some courses very high, some courses very low. And these differences do not appear to be a product of the instructor directly. They appear to be structural aspects of the course. But we don't know with only 10. So this is a tongue twister. I'm going to try to say it right. We should measure what matters because what we measure matters. President Faust has written, when we decide what to measure, we signal what counts. And I think our measures reflect our values. If we care about learning, as we do, if we care about engagement, as we do, what can we do to better align our metrics with those values? Authentic educational measurement is challenging, deeply challenging intellectually. It's deeply challenged politically. But I think this is a time for leadership. And Harvard is uniquely positioned to meet those challenges and to lead higher education in measuring what matters. Thank you.